Hey, what's up, guys? Isaac Hernandez here from the El Paso Creators Podcast Show. I am here with Francisco Castaneda. I usually call you Baco, so I was about to say Baco. Go if you it. guys know him, you guys can call him Baco. Uh, but we're here today at the Amano Artist Co-op uh, here in the heart of downtown. It's my favorite artist um, gallery in town, so if you guys have a chance, come check it out. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention to you guys is that we're here with our sponsor, Socialized, um, one of the best mangoneadas in town. I mean, I love their fried Oreos or funnel cakes. Um, if you guys have a chance to go hit them up, I'll go ahead and link them down on the description, you know, some little somewhere around here on the screen. Um, and today we have Francisco with us. Uh, Francisco, why don't you just go ahead and get started, you know, let people know a little bit about who you are, what you do, and of then course, we'll get first, from there. Well, first of all, thank you for having me, Isaac. Sure, thank course, you for yeah. the invitation. Uh, my name is Francisco Castañeda. I'm a local filmmaker here in El Paso. Basically, what do I do? I was actually just telling the person who pretty much set up your beautiful set right now that I have a hard time introducing myself as a filmmaker. Right. I want to introduce myself as, as an artist, mainly. Gotcha. So, it's, it's kind of like an ideology that I have where the future of the arts is going to be the mixing of all the mediums and everything. I paint, I do music, I make films, and so hopefully that catches on, the yeah. whole idea of me being a, a more holistic filmmaker or a mm. whole holistic artist. I think as a filmmaker, you can't really even label yourself as that, like as a filmmaker, you're yeah. just more of an artist. So yeah, yeah I get I, you, I get you. It's funny because you first have like that, that um, fraud imposter syndrome thing where you mm. don't know when to call yourself a, a filmmaker then you finally do and you're like well that's not even enough anymore like i yeah. want to be a, a, an artist as a whole yeah uh, and also because i mean i write i edit my own films i shoot a lot of my stuff so like it, it to me calling myself a filmmaker and that's it felt limited at least yeah. to me um but yeah basically what i do is i make films here in el paso i have been pitching to different companies here and there trying to get something going mm -hmm. uh locally and also lately, I've been kind of like taking up the idea of creating cultural events, festivals, things gotcha. like that. Gotcha. And you have one coming up, right? The, yes, the behind yes. the screens one. Tell us a little bit more about that one, what it is, uh, yeah, what so you're hoping to achieve with that, I guess. The yeah. behind the screens film convention. So basically, a lot of people are confusing it with a film festival. And that's something that I don't want us to confuse. Film festivals are amazing and they're great. Mm -hmm. But the vision behind the film convention is we're going to get five local filmmakers. Gotcha. And we're going to show their, as much as they can put of their filmography in a one hour window. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to invite a lot of local artists to create original pieces based on the films that they saw. So That's interesting because you're mixing two different mediums. Yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. it, it's basically an art exhibit based on the films that you get the to films. see as well. So it's, it's part museum, part uh, film festival in a way. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and so the idea here also is an exercise of interpretation, right? So the gotcha. idea is let's get those artists to watch the films and then mm -hmm. see what they come up with that is yeah. completely different than what the filmmaker would have made. Gotcha. Um, they are also going to get to show their storyboards, their scripts, kind of like the complete unfiltered version of their films. Yeah. And you get to see it through the filter of each individual artist. Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of like what we're working so, on. So it's right very now. interesting because you just see the whole process of how like, the idea came about and then the whole process and you mix an artist in there and then you're just like, okay, these artists get a whole different idea of what they view. It's kind of like with the, like, the audience, like, you know, like when they go see a movie or whatever in the, in yeah. the theater and stuff like that, it's mm -hmm. like whatever they interpreted, you know, they talk about it, but this time you're seeing it visually. I think yes. that's a really really cool idea so let's Thank talk you. about a little bit about how you got started in filmmaking now mm -hmm. um did you go to school or were you like self-taught when you joined filmmaking or did was there something else besides filmmaking that you first tried yeah well i, I started yeah. engineering for two years engineering. uh really good at it hated it mm -hmm. knew it wasn't for me so in that weird thing that you get when you're like 19 20 where you're like yeah. who am i i decided like well my whole life i've done art i i've played music i've yeah. drawn and everything and my favorite thing in the world were movies yeah so organically i was like okay i want to be a filmmaker have no idea where to start as a or, kid you just loved watching movies yeah, and stuff it yeah. was just a big movie fan and i started with the big blockbuster stuff like star wars or um now the marvel stuff like i love the blockbuster side of things but i yeah. also love the art house movies now gotcha. um but had no idea where to start i knew that i could draw so my first I don't know, my first avenue, my first way into the industry for me was going to be animation. Yeah. So first I went to Academy of Art in San Francisco for okay. animation. And then there I met someone, uh, my, my mentor of sorts, who yeah. told me basically like that I had a pretty good eye for camera stuff. So he forced me to quit animation and become a cinematographer. Yeah. And then in my first directing class, I, I don't know, my personality just kind of like came through. I Did, is it because like, he saw the talent in you and he was like, oh, you're not an animator, you're a filmmaker? Yeah, basically. Yeah. Like, at least that's what he says. Hopefully yeah. he was right. <laughs> um, but yeah, basically he pushed me to become a, a, a cinematographer first. Yeah. And then through that, I... I started sharing with him like my scripts, my writing, my editing, everything that I did. And he was told me like, okay, just become a, a, a filmmaker, as, yeah. like as a whole, as a director. So from there, I finished my school there and I come back to UTEP. 
uh, here in El Paso where I majored in digital media production. Gotcha. And while I was doing that, I started my own production company with some local filmmakers here. Mm -hmm. And through that company, we made most of my films. We've traveled the US and, mm -hmm. and some international film festivals with awesome. my films. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's, that's how so, I got. So what have been like some of your, like your, I guess your biggest films or how was your first film? Let's start about it that way. Like how was your first film? My how first did you film. go about making that one? It's, it's interesting yeah. because all of my films have something to do with mental health. That, mm -hmm. That's something that, that's super important to me. And I, is, I, yeah. I love the idea of perspective. So the way you shoot something, that's the perspective of the audience pretty much because that's the window into your film, I right? I feel you, exactly. But yeah. mental health is something that completely changes your perspective mm -hmm. depending on whether or not you are sane or not mm -hmm. sane. And, the Joker and movie. The Joker that movie, one for was example. Intense. Yeah. It's very intense. And that's a, a very good version of a blockbuster version of what I do. Yeah. Um, I, I love to incorporate all the different variables of like the films that I love. I love anime. I love painting i love like mm. incorporating a lot of variables into the films that i make so basically using that into mental health was very difficult at first because yeah. i wanted to become i wanted to play with the idea of the surrealist um fantastic yeah. surrealism kind of thing but it was so difficult to film when you barely have a budget and you're just kind of like starting with like yeah. the camera the dslr that you have in your house so i wrote a script uh not knowing if i was gonna film it at all i just kind of like wrote it to see if yeah. i could uh, about a kid with that lies to his dad and starts taking antidepressants and says that he has mental health issues. Okay. And his dad sends him to a psychi psychiatric ward where the whole film takes place in and he gets to see real victims or real yeah. patients there. Um, so the whole time he was like kind of just lying about it to, I guess, I guess make himself look some type of way. And then yeah. he actually saw the real thing. Yes, and he's like, yes. wow. Now, yeah. This is me verbalizing and intellectualizing what the film was supposed to be. Gotcha. What okay. ended up happening is that I made a film that was extremely surreal and experimental and weird. And I thought I was super avant-garde and like it was my movement. Yeah. But in making that weird ass film, I ended up finding out a lot about like what it takes to make a movie. Yeah. So and what did you learn? Yeah. Oof, I, like you're on your first film that you made with that one. Like, so what did you learn? I think we all have this weird notion. Maybe it's just because we're naive yeah. that you have an Oscar winner right there. You just haven't written it yet. Like gotcha. it feels like it's so easy to you. And mm -hmm. then once I finally wrote something that I personally thought was incredible and I filmed it with as much as, as much tools and as many people that I could get into it. And I realized like, it's not that good. Like it's, it's good, but it's not what I thought I was making. Yeah. And so in that I realized like, okay, I need to learn how to direct my actors properly. So I started um, studying acting, not because I want to be an actor, but I needed to know how to talk to them. Yeah. I realized my script was kind of weak. So I started uh, creating writing and other, other things like that. Uh, the only thing that kind of held up were my visuals because I've always been like a very visually oriented person. I'm a mm -hmm. photographer as well. So that was the only thing that I wasn't too, yeah. I don't know, critical of. Mm -hmm. But moving forward, that's something that I carried with me. The idea of every single film that I make from then on had to be a clear step up from the previous film. And so that's mm -hmm. kind of like what, what my whole career has been is almost like a film school so far. It's, yeah. it's every single short film that I make needs to see seem like I've been growing so much since the first yeah, film. Yeah, like you're, you're doing something new in each film and yes, all that. Yes, yeah. Um, I guess what is, for most of the filmmakers that are out there, maybe even starting or somebody, someone who's professional at your mm -hmm. level, what is something that's maybe something that you like you first got hit with as far uh -huh. in the filmmaking industry and you're like, wow, I for sure have to know this if I want to keep pursuing filmmaking? Oof. That, that, that question is a complicated one because I can like go yeah. in either way. But one of the big things that I had to learn was to collaborate. That, that's the biggest thing is mm. find the best artists that you know and yeah. try to pitch them ideas see what they got to, to say see see how good they are in the industry that you're getting to trying to get into uh -huh. and put your stuff out there for sure I, I was so nervous of finishing my work and letting people see it because yeah. I'm a perfectionist and that's the worst that you can be as an artist is being a perfectionist because your work's never done yeah and so, so how do you know when your work's done then you Oof, know, like, I still don't to you, be still, honest, you still want to keep putting stuff in there what I do honestly yeah. is I just set up a due date where I say this is the last day I get to work on this film mm -hmm. and whatever the film looks whatever like comes out, that's comes out. What the film is because okay. I used to not do that I used to kind of like just let it be I, I, because there's not like a production company behind me kind of saying like, we gave you all this money, make right. the film now. I used to just let it happen. Like I was like three years from now, the movie will come out. Yeah. And I, I didn't like the, the idea of making something and then wait so long for it to come yeah. out. So I, I started holding myself accountable and saying like, okay, I have 
six months to edit this and whatever the film looks like, I put it out there. And so like, that's why like events like the convention that I'm doing or film festivals are super useful for starting filmmakers because it forces you to have a, a deadline. To have something done. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so I guess I, there's two questions out of that that I got out of is, mm -hmm. you know, collaboration. You talked about that one a little bit. Mm -hmm. How important are collaborations to you as, 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 as far as I, an artist or a filmmaker? Mm -hmm. And would you ever say no to collaborations or do you want to take like every collaboration that comes to, to you? Okay, to answer your first question, I, I think collaboration is everything, but not just in the arts, in, in life. Like, yeah. <laughs> to be honest, you, you are what your peers say you are. When yeah. do you become a doctor? Well, until someone gives you the diploma and says, now you're a doctor. The market right? defines you. Yeah, yeah, kind of. But beyond the market, it's just the, the society as a whole defines yeah. you. And so to me, that's, that's a huge part of it. Also, I have this idea of, of um, working with people that don't necessarily match everything that I think and don't necessarily match my ideas and everything but that they want to make the best film possible. Yeah. So for example, like for me, I love clashing with the people that I'm working with in a healthy way. If we're both trying to make the best movie ever, but we just, we're trying to debate what the best version is, mm -hmm. that's great to me. I love that debate. I love that conversation. Cause like if you have two polar ideas and they clash, it, cr it creates synthesis. And gotcha. that synthesis of ideas is what becomes the film, which is, a way better product than what I could have made on yeah. a vacuum by myself. So like you would prefer limited. collaboration? I prefer collaboration. Yeah. Now, having said that, yeah. to your second question, would I take any collaboration that comes my way? Exactly. No, yeah. I, I would not. Mm -hmm. And that, that doesn't mean that I'm like on my pedestal and I think that I'm above no. people at all. I, I want to be excited what I, about what I'm working with. So like yeah. if, if anyone, regardless of their level as an artist, comes to me and has a pitch that excites me, then I'll say yes. Gotcha. But if someone, again, regardless of their level, if you're an amazing filmmaker, but your pitch sucks and I just don't enjoy mm -hmm. it, I probably, probably Because no. you've also reached, like I guess, the standard of where you want to be at, and yeah. you've worked toward that, so you don't want somebody to come in and be like, bring you down a little bit, right? Yeah, and not just necessarily no. bring you down, but it, it's I, I have to be intellectually honest with yeah. the person that I want to work with. And if I'm not excited, then the project's not going to be good. Gotcha. So I, I'll much rather work off of what excites me, what gets me passionate about something. And right. also because I, I know I bring a certain value with exactly. me, but I want to know what value you bring so that that synthesis that I'm talking about is actually yeah. something way greater than what I could have made instead of just feeling there's a difference between collaboration and compromise. Yeah. I don't want to compromise with people. I want to exactly. collaborate. Yeah, you don't want to fake promise anybody anything. Yes, exactly. um, as far as like, uh, again, back to an artist and a filmmaker, mm -hmm. do you ever reach a point where you're just like, man, I have nothing to put out or, you know, you probably have like that writer's block. How do you go about that? How do you deal with it? We, we all deal with it. And, yeah. and I honestly, the only way that I know how is to make something in all the other mediums that I, that I know how to do. So like yeah. if there's no movies in my head right now, there's nothing that inspires me, I make a song or I make a painting. And then through that process, through that making of something else, I, that sparks an idea. And that's you usually how it. how it works. But it, it doesn't have to be just... Uh, art like I, I love philosophy I, I study a lot of philosophy so like sometimes I'm just reading a philosophy book and I'm like oh you know what this point's amazing I'm gonna write a whole script about this uh, um, so that's kind of like usually how it comes from I, I hate being stagnant I hate not moving so yeah. like at all times I'm creating something the quality of that something I'm making is debatable that's up to the viewer <laughs> but I'm usually trying to create things because the, just to keep your inspiration it just keeps out. it rolling yeah. to see uh -huh. the point yes and so also when you're making these type of things like as far as like when you said music painting uh, mm. filmmaking a lot of people they, they think that they need the, the best tools available to them mm. um, I always tell a lot of photographers you know you have your phone now your phone is actually better than a camera right um, how did you get started you know when you pursued filmmaking where did you get like the most Decent amount of equipment, no, no, no. or how'd you start? I started with my mom's DSLR that yeah. she bought like on a whim, and it was like the most basic. It was like a Canon T T one I, something horrible. Yeah. Oh wow! Like it shot on seven twenty. It was yeah. a very very basic camera, but yeah, I started just shooting myself uh, playing soccer and yeah. just trying to make like little video edits from that. Mm -hmm. But from that, it just sparked the the interest of like, okay, what else can I make in this medium? And Later on, I started buying more equipment. And the more you do, that's the other thing about collaboration is yeah. that you're not limited to the resources that you have. If you and I made a, a movie and you have other cameras other than my, myself, we're going to use your cameras, my cameras. Like that collaboration also works in resources and things like that. Mm -hmm. But to your original you know, point, yes, your phone. Like yeah. go out there and shoot something. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that it's going to be professional grade yet, but if it's a learning tool, use anything, anything mm -hmm. that you got. And also like... The, the, I, I was talking to, to my creative partner, Luis, who, who I make most of my films with. I was telling him, like, we are so spoiled because the, the filmmakers of the 70s, 60s, dude, yeah. like, if you see the cameras that they had to work with and they had to cut it's the actual crazy. film and yeah. everything, like, 
it was a rich man's game. Yeah. We're like now making films. Any kid with an iPhone and a laptop oh. can make a feature film. And it's crazy. I see like my little cousins are like two years, three years old, and they already know how to move YouTube on their phone and stuff like that. So yeah. it's just like nobody can use that excuse that they can't learn how to do it yeah. either. And, because, and that's your yeah. thing because we're so stuck on screens all the time. Yeah. Our visual literacy is so high. Like you can show a kid now different artistic compositions and they get them way more than people before because mm -hmm. like all the information that you're constantly consuming is through that screen. Mm -hmm. So like all these kids are like, it's almost like they come programmed with that idea. Obviously yeah. they don't, but like they, it's, they're a product of their environment. Yeah. And so like their visual literacy is so above what ours was and what our parents was. Like it, we keep evolving as a species. Yeah. And I think that the, the future is through, through gotcha. this. Mm -hmm. And so you, you put a lot of films out about mental health, yes. about um, the, the view of society and all that. Mm -hmm. Which one's been the, kind of your most toughest one, I guess, to make because of Oof. how fragile the, the topic was. Right. Oh, how'd you, because how'd you of the topic. It? Or oh, because of the topic or just any, any other way you want to answer, but which has been like your most fragile one to make? Right. I mean, making a film is going to a war every single time. There's yeah. always going to be a problem that you don't count in. The biggest um, hurdle though was definitely, okay, I made a movie named Bunny King. Yeah. And when I made Bunny King, I made it because I wrote a script after my grandma passed away. And I wrote it almost like as an exercise of, of coping with loss or whatever. And yeah. I wasn't planning on making it at all. I just kind of like wrote it. It was like my artistic, I don't know. Uh, peace to my grandma yeah. and then once I started showing that to my peers and to different professors they told me like, you know what we think it's good enough for you to make it you should consider it so after that I started maybe considering filming it the ball kept rolling people kept getting excited and when I filmed that that was the most tough because it, I mean I don't even want to like spoil what the movie is because I want to show it it hasn't been out yet so I don't want to like just tell you everything but basically it's a girl who loses her brother to cancer and right before she the, the brother dies she keeps telling him the stories of Alice in Wonderland and gotcha. makes up this character of the bunny king who her brother just kind of like completely buys into and says like when I die I'm gonna go to Wonderland and become the bunny king so later in the movie she goes to uh, group therapy and in the group therapy every character in the group are the characters of Alice in Wonderland okay. but grounded yeah and so like that whole idea just came about as like again like as an exercise just to, yeah. to see but making it I didn't realize how emotionally how compromised yeah. I was because I'm usually very, I don't know, very serious. I, I uh, Not to be say that I'm monotone or that I don't show emotion, but I'm very like quiet, very right. stoic when I direct. In this movie, I think I cried like four times on set, really? which is crazy. Well, I remember you showed me some of the previews and I was like, wow, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is it, intense. And the other problem is you don't want to make just a depressing movie and that's it. Like you're trying to like fit it with like your ideas of the world. Tell the story in it. So yeah. to, to keep everything kind of like focused, it was difficult and then editing i didn't touch the edit for like seven months because i was i just couldn't open it i will yeah. open the files and cry immediately so i was like okay <laughs> until i grow out of this pain so I, it's I tough for you it. to, to make your own stories too right yes yeah and so crazy. like in that sense like when people say oh it's so difficult to make a movie because i don't have the right camera or the right lights it's like dude try to make a movie when you cry every single time you open your files like that's tough making yeah. a movie with your phone it's just a technical hurdle that you have to overcome, I guess. Right. Mm -hmm. That is crazy. And so I always encourage a lot of people, especially if you're a photographer or some type of artist or musician, to mm -hmm. always put content out there, to always just throw yes. your, your work out there. Because, mm -hmm. you know, your, your first three, obviously those aren't going to hit. You know, yeah. it's, it's yeah. your first three works a lot of people are going to see. But as, if you put it out there a little bit more, eventually one's going to hit. How important do you think that is, maybe also in the filmmaking industry, to just put your work out there consistently? Or do you pace yourself on putting out your work? Mm. Or is it different I, for filmmakers? I think it's super important in any medium, obviously, to, especially because you're comparing yourself constantly to your peers. And so I remember when I first set out to become a filmmaker, I told my family, like, I'm not comparing myself to any of my peers. I'm comparing myself from day one to Stanley Kubrick or Akira Kurosawa or like the great yeah. masters on, on the medium just because I want to get to that point. So if I am keep comparing myself to people that I'm surrounded by, those wins are not going to taste that well. But like if I'm yeah. comparing myself to the greats, right. if I get close to them, then that's going to feel incredible. So in that sense, though, it makes you very insecure when you're starting out because everything seems to not be on that level. Everything's, yeah. Everything that you make seems to be so far away from what your masters are creating or the masters that you kind of like assign to yourself. Um, but I, I will never remember, like the, I will never forget the first time that I went to, to a film festival. Mm -hmm. um, I was so excited. I was like beyond myself that I even got into the film festival because it was with my first film. Yeah. The film, again, was like very experimental, surrealist, weird movie. And I guess I kind of like forgot what movie I was going to show because I was there. You get to see all these films and then my movie starts playing and I, I was so embarrassed about it. Like I, I realized like my movie's not, I don't think it's good enough to be up yeah. there. 
but those those things kind of shape you those things yeah. kind of like make you and if you have the passion to keep going after something like that like that, that's what really pushes me like mm -hmm. I, I don't ever want to have an experience like that but also when you're starting out you have to have experiences like that you have yeah. to make a bad movie you mm -hmm. have to take a bad photo and put it out there yeah because if if you learn way more from your defeats than from your wins uh -huh. so, so so how do you take the judgment like do you I, obviously you probably take it as like a positive you know yes. like criticism but how do you let that affect your work or how do you implement that into your work um, I take to heart this thing that I think Bruce Lee said, which, that is, um, wise men are very grateful about criticism. Mm -hmm. If someone criticizes you, say thank you every single time. Even if exactly. you don't respect them, even if you don't think the criticism is fair, just say thank you. Yeah. Because first of all, the fact that someone took the time to tell you something already means something. But more than that, criticism is always useful. If, you, if you're gonna disregard it completely, then take it into account, see what it says, and then disregard it. Mm -hmm. But most of the criticism that people give you come from somewhere. Like no one just goes, I mean, I guess there's trolls now in the internet that just wanna do that, but like no one yeah. usually goes like, oh, your stuff sucks, that's it. Yeah. Like they usually have something to say behind the why it sucks. Gotcha. So remove your ego and just try to listen to that. Now, yeah. obviously super easier said than done. Yeah. When people attack your art, like that's your baby, right? You yeah. wanna like, fight them immediately but as you grow up you have to just kind of like remove your ego at all times and just take it take yeah. it for what it is and so how do you i guess no i guess my first question would be yeah. when you first had a film that i guess failed or mm -hmm. you know didn't do as good or a lot of people hated it how did you sit back on that and you just kind of let it whim in the air for a little bit and then mm -hmm. you know kept going with it like i guess your, your biggest struggle i guess how did you go about that and your biggest failure well like, i will say the 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 weird thing about the question is how do you how do you count success do you what success what is success right because yeah. none of my films have failed but they've been in different levels of quality so like for me my first movie that i don't think was a great movie didn't fail necessarily because it was a teaching tool for me to right. keep going right so as long as you see everything that you do as a teaching tool to keep to keep you going to the next thing i think there is no there's no possibility of failure and also a failure should excite you. Like it, 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 for me, whenever I fail at something, I, I gain so much knowledge that, it, that it's worth it. Every single yeah. time that's been the case. Now, when I succeed, obviously your ego, it's super inflated yeah. and it's a great moment to celebrate, but you don't really learn much from the, from yeah. the wins. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, so then your, your, your win one now, like your, your most successful film, one mm -hmm. that's probably made it pretty good. Mm -hmm. How did, how did you take that about a lot of people? Maybe that's when they get their ego and they're like, oh man, I finally hit an Oscar winning type of thing or whatever, you know, like I'm good right. now. Um, obviously that's not your, your stopping point, but how did you go about probably your most successful film now? Like, what did you get from that? Yeah, I, I honestly, I mean, to be super honest, and if I can like criticize myself for this, when I started, I was all ego. Like mm -hmm. it was all like a, an exercise of my own arrogance and yeah. how great I was and the tour that I was gonna become and blah, 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 bullshit, bullshit. And in realizing this, I, I noticed like my films are limited because of how much I'm trying to be this tyrant that has the only voice in the, in the room, whatever. And then I made my, my best work to date, um, which was Bunny King, the same movie yeah. that I just pitched you. And that movie was completely a collaborative effort. And I worked with the best actors that I've ever worked with. So like, I kind of like gave myself up to them. And I said, like, I'm here to help you. Exactly. My VP, I, I worked with him for like three months before we even shot a single frame. Yeah. Uh, we went to different locations. We started the light quality that we were gonna get at different places. We tried different lenses. We, we did like our homework. So by yeah. the time we were there, I felt confident. Same thing with the script, same thing with everything else. So it's almost like I had to kill my ego for me to succeed later yeah. on. And now from then on, like it's all been a, a good process upwards. Yeah, I, and I like how you said that, because a lot of people don't let go of that ego. They're just like, you know, it's always me first before anything else, and yeah. it's my idea. And so I guess that's like always the number one rule I live off of too. I don't know how many times I mentioned different people. It's like, if it doesn't work for you, it's not gonna work for me. Yeah, it needs to work for you first. And true empathy, yeah. like you to truly put yourself in someone else's shoes. Exactly. Like if you were gonna be in someone's movie, it's not someone's movie, it's their movie too. Like yeah. if you were gonna act in something, you will be so excited about it that you will make it your, your and movie. And they're also making your movie, you know? It's they're, like their acting performance is what gets it. Exactly, yeah. so to give mm -hmm. them a place where they feel welcome, where they feel like, oh, my voice actually is being heard. Yeah. Like that that creates an environment to work so much, that, that is so much better than the opposing side, which is just, no, you're just here as my soldier and you do as I say. Like that doesn't, that doesn't that's not conducive to great art, yeah. I think. And and I want to talk about sacrifices too. A lot of, you know, artists, they have to sacrifice something. So as far as like maybe um, 
judgment from their parents or whatever and they, you know they have to not listen to their parents in order to pursue what they want to do or maybe it's work or something like that so any sacrifices that maybe you had to take in order to keep doing what you're doing mm. um i mean with the family stuff I, i've been extremely blessed and lucky that my family was super supportive from day one yeah um i was so nervous of telling my dad like hey i'm quitting engineering school and starting film you know what i mean yeah. like that's something that you that you think they're gonna laugh you out of the room and tell you like no you're not but yeah. to my dad's credit he told me immediately like okay how if you're gonna do this let's do it the right way so do your research mm -hmm. see what what schools are gonna so, so you made a plan before you pursued it or did you just kind go straight of, into I, it? I, I kind of made a plan, but yeah. it was a very half-assed plan. I just needed okay, to gotcha. show my dad something. Like, I wasn't yeah. completely lost. And then he was the one who, like, kind of took the reins and was like, okay, yes, but let's do it like this. Yeah. And so he helped me on my way out. Um, as far as struggles and sacrifices, though, I think the biggest one is probably time. time. Like, the time that you have to dedicate this, like, you have to be willing to invest that level of time. Yeah. You're not gonna have a lot of social life if you're real about this. If you're if you're completely committed. Yeah. Now, obviously, the time that you're gonna invest is gonna be, is gonna reward you later on when you yeah. get to see the final product. Of course, the time that you put into it benefits you. But a lot of the people say that they want something, but then you see them partying every weekend and yeah. you see them like barely they don't doing get any anything. progress done. And so like, just get, let go of that. Sacrifice mm. your time. Sacrifice. The, the fun that you can have now for yeah. the fun that you're going to have. And that's what I like about your films too is that you focus on even that mental health part of it. So it's even also having your mindset right and mm -hmm. making sure that you even pace yourself too. So not just jumping into something and then like putting like 30 projects on you and then not getting any of them done. So I kind of like how your films are just very mental health oriented that, you know, keeping yourself sane but also seeing like the real struggles in the world. Right. Um, so when you, talk, when you talked about your sacrifices and the sacrifices that you've had, um, what good came out of something that you kind of had to sacrifice and then what bad came out of it in order to keep pursuing what you're doing? Hmm. I mean, what good came out is that I kept going in the thing that I wanted to make. Yeah. Like, I kept making my movies, I kept improving. What bad came out of it? That's a good question because I feel like uh, there's this idea in philosophy that you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And so, like, I feel like it's in my blind spot. I'm sure that there's so many things that I missed out on because I was working on the, on the films or whatever. But... I, I don't see them necessarily as things that I sacrificed or things that I like missed out on yeah. because life is that, right? Like all mm. the, the doors that you don't go through, uh, that's just an option that you didn't take, but there's options mm. that you are taking, that you are moving forward. So as long as I'm not stuck, I feel like I'm good. And it's funny because mm. like, not to make it a very existential thing, but like now with the pandemic and everything, I feel like yeah. everybody had to kind of question themselves like, is this what I actually want to do? And yeah. for me, it was weird because when I, I was already like living my dream or so I thought I was like I'm a filmmaker I'm doing what I would love to do yeah and now I'm forced to be in my house and not do it so I was the other question I was gonna ask you is like how did you get through that or like what did you do did I, anything I mean, change I, I, I changed a lot yeah. and I made a lot of mistakes in my personal life that changed me that yeah. broke me that if I had any ego left after Bunny King all those mistakes <laughs> definitely destroyed it yeah and coming out of it so Bunny King was filmed before the pandemic? Before the pandemic, okay, before. yes, yes, gotcha. yes. Um, so you finished filming it and then boom, and pandemic And editing, yeah. during the pandemic, I finished editing it. Gotcha. And I was kind of like left at like, okay, what do I do with this? I, I sent it to a bunch of film festivals, big film festivals that were accepting it. And then they told me like, hey, you either get to show it uh, online or here's like a waiver so that you can send it once we are, not back once on, we can actually do it in yeah. person. So I pulled out Bunny King from all the film festivals that I was already very excited that I got in. Um, but in that process, I was like, okay, I cannot just cry for my film that is not making it yeah. to the film festivals right now. So I started writing like crazy. You got to keep moving. Yeah. yeah. And, and from that, it came about a lot of projects. I, I started meeting with different producers from, from different companies, um, whether it's like a Netflix or an Amazon or like even in Mexico, like mm. some places that, that were looking to fund some of my projects. And from that, I just like started writing like crazy and seeing if I could make films that I could pitch them. Gotcha. So that's kind of like what I've been working on. Mm. And... Um, so I guess after the pandemic, so you edited that Bunny King during the pandemic, I right? finished editing it. You finished editing pandemic. and then you sent it out and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, something that I got out of that too is how important do you, do you think it is to reach out to all these different people? You know, like I always tell people, I'm like, send 500 DMs a day or whatever, you know, yeah. eventually somebody who you're going to want to contact right. is going to contact. You just never know. So how yeah. important do you think the whole networking and type of, you know, reaching networking out? Networking gets is. super complicated lately because I feel like people have this weird word perspective of what networking is. Gotcha. Networking is not having a lot of likes in your Instagram post. No. Networking mm. is making making connections with people so that you can actually get Real have lunch or have a podcast or yeah. like talk to people. Mm. Like to me, 
social media has kind of like made it seem like it's completely democratic and yeah. everybody gets a bunch of likes and everyone gets famous and it's not. That's it's not, not what that. it's about. The real value of networking is maybe meeting, for example, I used to tell you that I'm, I'm getting into philosophy. And it's so funny because I was telling a friend of mine, if you try to contact the greatest minds in filmmaking, they have millions of followers. If mm -hmm. you try to contact the greatest minds of music, they have millions of followers. So most likely if you send them a DM, they're not going to respond to you. Yeah. The thing about philosophers is that they're not rock stars. They have 400, 500 followers. Yeah. So if you reach out to them, they'll answer back. Yeah. And so for me, I was like, oh, like I'm talking to these people that are way farther in me in this field than me in this field. They're geniuses and I get to talk to them. And that to me is the real networking. It's finding a venue to kind of like get in, talk to someone that's yeah. way above you or an equal and say, how can I benefit from this connection that I'm making? And also, how do I make myself benefit you? Yeah, so, so who's your number one inspiration or who, who do you really look up to? Like, do you have like somebody that you use mm. as a mentorship type of thing? Yes, I mean, yeah. I mean the the Besides yourself. cliche, <laughs> yeah, me. So yeah, the, the cliche corny thing will be to say my dad, so I will put my dad first, and mm -hmm. then the actual artistic mentors. That, that's a hard one because there's many people that that chase after something without limiting themselves. To me, that's that's my biggest inspiration. So, for example, ah, it's so hard. Freddie Mercury, which Freddie it's, Mercury. A, it's okay. a it's a it's a weird controversial statement to make I guess but the fact that he started opera yeah. uh, because he wanted to be a very trained singer and then he used that to create rock and roll theatrical songs that is not anything that was in his wheelhouse at mm -hmm. first but he used that skill to make that to me that's great it's how do I take a skill that I'm learning and applying it to what I actually want to make right. so Freddie Mercury is one and, and like him I can tell you so many Christopher Nolan Akira Kurosawa mm -hmm. Um, da Vinci who like studied science and math and art like yeah. those so, people that are very holistic I admire so that's what I'm getting at is because a lot of people they want to be they want to be this person and they're like you know I want to have everything that person has but then they, they start putting into themselves I'm like well, okay well you can't be them because right. they took a lot of time in order to get there yeah um, so it's like okay so you don't want to be you, you want to be them but obviously you're not them and mm -hmm. you know don't put whatever they're doing as far as like themselves on you right so it's like okay if you want to be if you want to reach out to them you can reach out to them but more than likely, they're not going to answer. Like, and also, you know, why like, would like, you want to be them? There's exactly. already a them. Yeah. There, there, there's not a you yet. And I know that's very cliche to say, mm. but for example, like the, the, I have this saying that I love that is uh, stand on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. And this idea is, why should I try to be the next Kubrick or not better than Kubrick? I, yeah. I should be trying to be better than him because he already existed. Yeah. And, and there's this idea of, um, there's this cellist, I forget the name, but he was like 94 and they were filming him in his house and he was practicing the cello yeah and they were telling him like dude why would you practice at 94 like i think that whatever you like made with your life you already made yeah and he said like well the thing is right now i'm the greatest cellist in the world and every single day that i keep practicing i improve just a little bit just a little bit just a little there's bit. something still to learn but the thing is yeah. what i what it took me 94 years to learn i can teach to someone in two years so if I teach a master cellist, all of my skills that I kind of like put into myself in 94 years, they mm. only take two years to learn it. So yeah. now all the process that they're going to make in their 94 years, it's above what I made. And that's gotcha. how we should kind of like see society is okay. there's already a Kubrick. I can learn everything from him and then improve upon what he already taught mm. me because the next generations are going to improve upon me. So it's almost like just kind of like passing it on and mm. hopefully benefiting the arts yeah. the messages that we're trying to, to create so is that where you get your ideas from like whenever you're making a film you just see you know what do you see what's going on like recently now or do you make a film or something about what, what happened like past i mean it's all abstract right yeah. like the history always repeats itself so like it feels like you have a great original idea and it's not original there's no original ideas mm -hmm. but there is original takes or original filters that you put into ideas mm -hmm. so for me creativeness or creativity is the connection of two points that don't appear to have a connection, that's where you come in, right? Yeah. How do we make something connect to something that doesn't seem... So, for example, like, I speak two languages, I play music, and I know a lot of philosophy. Well, if I make a movie that's bilingual, that it's about a kid learning philosophy but falls in love with music, that's a very specific movie to me yeah. that a lot of people couldn't make. Just like I couldn't make movies of your life experience or what you know, right? Yeah. So like the more you improve yourself in other aspects of your life, that's going to kind of feed back into mm. what so, you make. So is that how kind of like your, your process goes about? Is like you first connect everything you kind of know about and you make a film off of that? Or do you have like yeah, certain structure I, I mean, of how you make it? To be super honest, dude, I don't know if I have a process per se. Like it's yeah. all abstract. I feel like it sounds so 
primitive but like i just throw shit at the wall and whatever yeah. sticks because that's how you should do it and that's what i'm getting at is that like a lot of people think that they should have like a, like a plan when they're creating a piece of artwork you know right. that there needs to be this and that right. but the reality is is just just do something yes. and see what I, comes out I, of it i mean you yeah. can have a purpose statement but your purpose statement should just be the spark yeah. like the what you're gonna end up making might not even be about what you made it about like mm. uh bunny king i made it for my mom or for my grandma rather it's not about my grandma at all like yeah. you see the movie you will never think like oh the director like never like you yeah. will never but what i was making the synthesis of ideas is so original that i'm glad that i had that original concept or that original idea so that that sparked the movies that i ended up making yeah mm -hmm. and um so where where are you at right now like what what's what's going on next for you or where do mm -hmm. you want to go within the next i guess three years five years and then ten years what are your goals for the future the thing about me is that I rarely have time to, like I said, like I'm completely giving up on my social life because I'm, yeah. I love what I do. But in saying that, I wanted to create a, a community here in El Paso, but that's limited. Like I want to create a community, hopefully globally, yeah. of people that, that share my ideas of like, how do we push the mediums? How do we push this idea of if you're a, a painter, okay, watch my movie, make a painting. Let me watch one of your paintings and make a movie. Like how do we keep pushing each other forward? So in that... Uh, I created a group that are creating cultural events, little pop-ups here and there here in El Paso that are going to kind of hopefully promote this community sense of the yes. arts. Um, that's one side of what I'm working on. The other side is always just the production of my art. So I'm working on, on a film right now that we're pitching to Netflix. Um, I'm showing the kind of like the pitch short film that we made mm -hmm. uh, the next festival that we're going to have. Um, so that's something that I'm working on. And the other thing is podcasting. Like yeah. not, not necessarily my podcast, but going to podcast and kind of like- be Just getting like your a, word out there. Yes, yeah. be an, an evangelist of like, how do we make this uh, intellectual conversations about the arts fun for people to like kind of get into it. Exactly. And then that's why that's why I really like having this podcast too, mm -hmm. is because I get people who are, who are guests who also get to get their word out there a little bit more, mm -hmm. but they also network within it. So they don't right. even know who's, they, you never know who's listening. You know, somebody who's maybe looking for a filmmaker or something like that, or, you yeah. know, anybody in general yeah. could be listening to it and be like, eh, I want to contact this person or whatever. So yes. that's also a very benefit. So that's why I always think that networking is also very, very big. And, and, and to your yeah. credit, I, Isaac, I feel like creating anything yeah. creative that is not in an environment that like it's easy for you to just do it. Like if you yeah. were in LA and you wanted to make a film, you yeah. have plenty of people to ask. Yeah. Where in El Paso is more difficult. It is. And, and so podcasting is more difficult. Yeah. Making art is more difficult. But that, to me, just makes means that the incentive is that much higher. Yeah. And so like to your credit, I said, like, yeah, I know that you've created the El Paso creators and everything. Like that's something that pushes the thing forward. And that's yeah. something that I align myself with. So like mm. that, that's good for you. Then. So then I also kind of want to ask you this question is like, mm -hmm. how do you get out of your comfort zone? How did you get out of something you weren't comfortable doing? Like, for example, me, I was very shy. I was very shy in speaking in public mm. and that. I had to overcome that. And now it's kind of almost natural for me. Right. But what is something that you came over off of? And like, how did you go over your comfort zone? I guess does that make sense? I was always great. I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> I was always perfect. No, no, no. I'm Paco. <laughs> no, no, no. Honestly, my comfort zone was calling myself out and holding myself accountable that I wasn't great. accountability. My joke that I just made that I, I, that wasn't me. Like <laughs> putting myself in the position of like, you know what? Like, no, you have to learn shit. Like, you have yeah. to. You're not great yet. And so, like that idea forces you to, for example, I took art, uh, um, acting classes, and in yeah. the acting classes, they do some weird shit that I'm completely it's not me like mm -hmm. one of my acting classes they told us like okay close your eyes right now you're a tree move like a tree that's so people that know me laugh when i tell the story because that's so unlike me they will yeah. never picture me doing this <laughs> but i did it because to me it was like worth okay this somehow directly or indirectly is gonna benefit me directing an actor yeah and so like putting yourself in uncomfortable positions and just getting through them mm -hmm. for example you used to talk about public speaking I guarantee you that the first times that you did it, you hated it, you weren't great I at it. I did. But yeah. the fact that you did them now puts you in a position yeah. where now you can do it, you can have podcasts, mm -hmm. you can talk for a living. My, my first photo meet was very scary for me because I had a photo meet with a friend and it was like maybe like five to eight people that showed up. Yeah. And so that was even scary for me. I was like, I don't even know any of these people and all that. Yeah. Little by little, we ended the night with like 120 people. And yeah. so I had to make like a little speech at the end. We we're doing a giveaway and I'm talking to a bunch of people I don't even know. You were there, I think. Yeah, I wasn't. And so I was like, oh crap like i stuttered a lot i was scared but i was like no if i could overcome this 
then I could build this because another thing is that like I promise people that I can do this. I can yeah. make this type of platform. Yeah. And so it takes, okay, getting out of your comfort zone, doing things that you never tried before mm -hmm. and then making them happen. And you, you see the progress. You see it like, oh, if I never did this, I wouldn't be where I'm at right now. And you, you just look back at that and you're like, okay, wow, well, let me keep going because, yeah. Yeah. you know, you see that how, how it helped I, you out. And seeing yeah. progression, I mean, if, if we go back to like science, like mm -hmm. your body doesn't feel speed. It only feels acceleration, right? Yeah. When you accelerate your car, that's what you're, you're actually feeling. Yeah. In life, it's the exact same thing. Your body doesn't doesn't feel the the how great you're doing right now yeah. you don't feel it what you do see is the progress from where you started to now that's what you can actually kind of like feel right that movement that yeah. progression exactly. so as long as you see progression put yourself out there and, mm. and don't be afraid of making a fool of yourself mm. like i remember the first time that i directed yeah. i had no earthly idea of what like directing actually meant so like i remember that i told someone that was carrying one of my tripods yeah i told him to put it in my car and they got super offended because apparently you're not supposed to say that to whatever the crew member was. <laughs> and I, I kind of like, I remember I panicked. Like, I didn't know what to say. I apologized. But like, dude, I was the director. I could have just been like, to where people just fucking put the yeah, tripod, you know? Yeah. But I was so caught up in like, oh, I have to like work by the structure that I'm completely ignorant to. And I felt like it was the most embarrassing thing. That yeah. person that, that I had a moment with works with me in all my movies. Like, mm. we don't be worried about the stupid little mm. things. Like, just put yourself out there keep making stuff yeah. that's it and so have you always been just a filmmaker or were you like a, a freelance videographer where you did like commercial work or were you I mean, more I just focused do, on stories I, I still do freelance video um now mm -hmm. but my main my main goal is to it's become a narrative yeah. filmmaker okay. to me storytelling is everything mm -hmm. and it's funny because uh, I'm also a photographer and sometimes I get paid to do like kind of like these beauty shoots where I make people look great right and those are fun and they're good and I'm good at it but they're super limited because I tell them like, okay, that's fine, yeah. but how do we tell a story? And some people like are, have never kind of heard that idea or that pitch. So once I start pitching it to them, they get excited and they go like, you know what? Yes, let's tell a story. Yeah. Beyond me looking great, can we also add the story? But some people are like, no, 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 just let yeah. me make me look pretty. That's all I, I care for. And those used to be super difficult. Now, thankfully, I've done well enough in my career where I don't have to take those jobs. If you're not interested in telling a story, I'm not interested in working with you. So like that's, yeah. that's kind of where I'm at right now. And so I asked the question because of the marketing purposes. So whenever you create something, whether it's like a commercial video or something like that, like a story, how do you go about marketing it and pitching it? Because I feel like a lot of people, they, they want an answer to that question as far right. as like, okay, I made the film. What do I do next with it? Like, how do I pitch it? Right. How do you do it? What's your process of like marketing out well, your work? First, I used to suck at marketing and, yeah. and I wouldn't claim that I'm great, but like, I feel like I kind of like found my, my footing now. Because marketing, if you think about what marketing is in the in the raw, shitty sense of it, is promising a lot and delivering a little. And mm -hmm. that is scary in the arts because if you make a trailer that looks amazing and then you watch the movie and the movie sucks, there's a, sure, you, you got the one win because yeah. people went to see it, but who is gonna go watch your second or third? Mm -hmm. So for me, I realized that creating honest marketing and, and making people part of the process yeah. was way more interacting, uh, interactive for people and way more exciting for people. So what I started doing is show the behind the scenes stuff, talk about yeah. like podcasting, right? Like talk about what the film is about, um, get people that are interested in the specific subject that I'm talking about. So for example, mental health, I yeah. show my films to a lot of psychologists or people like in the, in the mental health industry. And those people, obviously they already come with a different way of looking at things. Yeah. So th their perspective of my film is completely different. I wouldn't show that if you want to go watch Star Wars or a Marvel movie mm. and then I show you one of my films, most likely you're going to be like, what the fuck is this? Like, th this is yeah. not what I wanted. So mm. you just have to be super honest, intellectually honest about what you're selling them. Mm. And I think in the arts, honesty always pays off. Yeah. Maybe that's not true of bigger brands because you want to sell at the end of it is you just want to make a profit mm -hmm. but in the arts you have the, the profit side of it you want to make a profit so that you can make the next thing yeah. but you also have the creating an audience part of it mm -hmm. like you want people to appreciate your art to understand your art to kind of like take that walk with you so yeah. that's kind of like where i'm at right now okay and then so the last two questions i kind of mm -hmm. wanted to ask you uh, before we run out of time is yes. um compared to where you're at right now what is mm -hmm. something you know now that you wish you would have known when you first got started so many things i i i wish I could have told myself to not be so arrogant and so caught up on like how great I thought I was. Yeah. Um, I also wish that I could have told myself to not be so critical of other people's work. Yeah. And that's something that I still see a lot in this idea of creating a community. Mm -hmm. You see it all the time where people go like, oh, I wouldn't want to work with that guy because that guy sucks. Yeah. And it's very limited. Like mm -hmm. it's so, such a reductive criticism. Right. Instead of saying like, 
his work doesn't align with my views, blah, blah, blah and try to make it a little bit more political correct. Even they all of a sudden think they're the best at it. Yes. Yeah. And so like, I feel like when I first came into this, I came in very arrogantly and very full of myself. So that's the one thing I wish I would remove myself from that. Like your ego thing, out of it. Yeah, completely yeah. my ego and destroyed my Freudian me. But the other thing is, I think I, I wish I would have known exactly where I wanted to take my career because when I first started, it was just kind of like what I said, right? Like, yeah. let's just make movies and if they're cool, they're cool. If they're not, they're not. And I made a lot of movies that I call them magic tricks where yeah. I trick you into thinking it was more profound than what it was or it was more beautiful than what it was or mm-hmm. it was super well shot, but I'm tricking you with beautiful colors and everything because I'm good at visuals. Yeah. But if, it, if they were empty, they were empty shells yeah. of movies. Now that I know exactly how to tell a story and, and have an actual message behind mm-hmm. it, I wish I would have told myself, like, don't, don't be so caught up on just, I don't know, making people like you. Mm-hmm. Just like the movie. That's just like it. Like I, I always movie. believe that. Just, just put your work out there. Like how I said earlier, it's like, for yeah. example, this podcast, my first 20, 30 episodes or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I think right now I'm not even at 30. I'm probably like at mm-hmm. 25 or whatever. But mm-hmm. my first 10, I'm like, obviously, maybe no one's going to see those yet. So I'm like, I can't wait till I reach my 100th episode, my 200th. Because even right. then, I'm going to be like, okay, I need to reach 500. Because yeah. the more you put out there, eventually, there's going to be one episode that boom. So it's like, yeah. just keep putting your work out there. as no matter, like, you think it's too good or you're probably like, oh, it needs to be perfect. You don't, I always feel like as a musician, too, like, you don't need to make sure that you, you have the most perfect track. Because yeah. the reality is you put that track out there and nobody listens to it. And so that doesn't really matter. Then just keep putting out music, music, music. Put 10 mu- pieces of music out yeah. rather than just perfecting one of them. And mm-hmm. that's, that's what I really think is that it really get, kind of gets you out there. Um, the yeah. other question I was going to ask you too is like the piece, the best piece of advice that somebody's probably given you or that you've came up with that you want to give to anybody following in the same industry as you, like filmmaking. Mm-hmm. <sighs> I mean, I have too many uh, advice given to me that I think is good. One of the best pieces of advice that I've ever gotten was someone who told me to shush. <laughs> to shush. Yeah. I, I feel like a lot of people just want to hear themselves talk because yeah. you think you have such a great idea so yeah. you think that you're so smart and so mm-hmm. just shush and listen to people around you even if you don't love their ideas maybe they have one mm-hmm. great thing to say and now you're better off for it yeah. but like hearing yourself speak who does that benefit mm-hmm. most likely no one if you don't know that much and if you kind of like dedicate yourself to learning yeah. then pick and choose your battles pick and choose when you get to talk so for sure Shush more, listen more. And the other thing that I wanted to say is there is this idea of trying to put your stuff out there no matter what, right? Yeah. And I, I share with you, I share, I share the sentiment of like, at some point, hopefully your podcast catches on, becomes mm-hmm. super famous and everything. But I do like the progression, right? You were telling me how like, now you have more equipment, you have bigger production. You're not stagnant just waiting for it to catch on. Yeah. You're... you're, you're constantly improving this the the what you're giving them mm-hmm. while making it so like yeah. that's your thing like don't make the same thing over and over just waiting for your opportunity like make sure that you keep yourself accountable exactly that's yeah. so that's that's a, that's a great add-on is that you're not just like not just putting the th- same thing out there but just add like how you said add on to it yeah, make sure that you're growing the quality because of it. that's the other yeah. thing right like if, you, if someone likes your first picture and then my picture seven they're like it's the same picture seven times people yeah. get bored and especially yeah. now that we're we have all the entertainment in the world so yeah. accessible like give them something to to get excited about like yeah. that, that's why like the events the cultural events that i keep pushing the reason they're exciting is because if i tell you right now let's go watch a movie that maybe yes maybe a, not yeah. depending on how you feel but if i tell you like we're gonna watch a movie then there's a concert then there's a, an art exhibit and at the end there's like this big dance with beautiful yeah, it's all connected uh, you're like wow yeah you're like yeah. You know, well, yes let's go to that for sure mm-hmm. so i feel like this more festival oriented convention oriented um cultural events mm-hmm. those are where where the arts should be moving towards because like the community is what's gonna make the art matter or not matter yeah it. and, and it's more challenging too so that's why i like having my events that i do now uh, i like doing them with mixed medium so before mm-hmm. i used to just have photography events just like art events right now i'm doing like the photography one where i mix poetry with photography and now right. the filmmaking Which one where it's like idea. filmmaking with arts you know yeah. and so it's yeah. like challenging these two to come together and see what they create yeah and so i, I really i really like that idea um mm-hmm. is there anything else that you want to mention before we go ahead and let you go uh, and no just it, so. that people should go to the to the film convention behind film the scenes film convention september 25th show up watch movies support watch your movies. local artists and That's the artwork it. too the artwork's gonna be amazing i know yes. you have like you have fox under you who else do you, you have under as your artist uh, i have sarai sassi i have carolina villarreal who's amazing amazing artist um there's so many there's uh 
Caitlin, oof, there's like 25, don't put me on the spot to name yeah. all the 25, but like there's a lot of great local there's artists that are incredible. Yeah. And what, what I like about it too is that like, for example, when I also host my events and this one too, it's their first time creating this type of artwork with like an event or first time showcasing their work. And so it, it's always good for me to always give them this opportunity and be like, you know, come out and sell your work or showcase your work right. and give them that first opportunity. Right, it's, always, it's, yeah. it's a platform and yeah. all of us are looking for platforms, mm -hmm. but it, to me, I, like I said, social media seems like a platform, but it's really not because it's, mm -hmm. it's limited to the algorithms, blah, blah, I don't want it to be technical. Yeah. But an event, whoever goes, goes. Like the, yeah. the people that are gonna see your work are gonna be there and, and have the experience. They don't get to scroll past your work that yeah. easily. So like to me, that, that's a huge yeah. thing. The other thing that I want to say is like, for example, the filmmakers. Film in El Paso is not that big right now. And, mm -hmm. and for me, I was completely opposed to making a film festival specifically, because I'm like, well, when you hear a film festival, the people that are not into film are just not going to go. Yeah. But if you have people that are super inter interested in the arts or in photography or something else, yeah. and you pair that or you have like a companion piece to the films, mm -hmm. that starts opening it up to people. It starts making people more interested in the medium. Yeah. And the other thing is the five filmmakers that we got right now, they're all super different, super diverse movies. Like there's comedy, there's action, there's like all kinds of genres, yeah. but it's not just genre oriented. You, it's fun to me to see where they come from. You see a lot of their filmography starts off with very basic filmmaking, yeah. films shot on iPhone, films shot like very, um, with primitive meanings. And, and now like then you see that the other, meaning, the other, the other films are super well produced with great resources. They, they have higher budgets. Yeah. Like it, seeing people's process to me, it's an educational tool on its own. And then being exposed to, to storyboards, to the scripts, all of that stuff. To me, I mean, obviously to me, that's candy because I'm a filmmaker. Yeah. But for people that are not interested in film, I think that's super interesting because you get to see that side, the art, and most importantly, the thing that I want to promote is the conversation. The conversation. Talk, talk to people. Yeah. Talk about why they made that painting. Mm -hmm. As the artist, there's going to be a Q and A where people what get they to like, expose. The panel. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. the, the panels where people get to expose like this mm -hmm. is why I made what I made, but also confront them, talk to them. Like yeah. the conversation is really what I'm after because. If you get just, if you get to just watch a movie and take it to yourself and no one ever talks about it, it's it's that uh, philosophical thought of like if a tree falls in the woods and no one hears it, did, did that tree even fall? Like yeah. no, like if, if you make a film that no one watches, then you didn't make a film. Yeah. So to to me, that's what it's important, like mm. promoting the conversation, making people mm. excited about it, and, and promoting it too. So I I researched that people have a, a span of attention of three to six seconds. Mm. So make those three to six seconds count whenever yeah. you're promoting yeah. your artwork. That, that's like the that. thing yeah. everyone tells you: your first page on a script has to be your best one. Your first yeah. ten seconds on a film has we have to capture people. Mm. If you don't capture people right They're away scroll on by they, or whatever they, yeah. they, we're limited our, our attention span is six seconds scary, most. I'm scared yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wait wait Paco hey, focus on it. <laughs> no but yeah no I, I, I love the cultural events because of that mm. because it forces you like you're and that's the other thing the peer pressure of yeah. If you're surrounded by 40 people looking at a painting, you better look at the painting. If you're the asshole not looking at it, it's kind of like, no, like look at it and make your own thought. If you it's hate it, you hate it. But yeah. let's all kind of have that conversation, right? Yeah, and it grows. Um, so before I let you go, where mm -hmm. can people find you? Where can people check out your work? Where can they contact you? So my Instagram is mainly the, the main thing that I use, uh, at Cinepaco, which is funny how I shit on social media so much and then I'm like, follow me on Instagram. Uh, no, so Cinepaco in, in social media. And I have all of my, my stuff right there, my email, my number, everything's just connected there. Just, so. just to contact you and even mm -hmm. maybe even collaborate with you or some. some yes, yes. If someone has a good idea, contact me. Yeah. I'm always open to it. Awesome, guys. Well, this does it for today's episode. Uh, Paco, I want to thank you so much for thank coming you. out to the show. I want to thank Socialize for um, giving us these awesome, awesome mangoñadas. Um, before we let you go, I, wanted, I want you to try it, see, see what you think of it. Um, Put me on the spot. What if, if I'm like, this if sucks. it's Paco rating, oh, yeah. <laughs> Mm. good this gets really good. five out of five pacos. five out of five pacos wow yeah. that's, a, that's a big rating right there <laughs> so go ahead and go check them out guys uh, socialize you can find them on instagram i'll put their instagram somewhere around here uh they do funnel cakes uh, fried oreos different types of sweets and treats and um we'll catch you guys on the next one thank you so much and before i let you guys out go also um i wanted to mention the artwork we had behind us um dead punk i didn't mention it in the beginning but make sure you guys go check him out i'll go ahead and link him down too um and thank you guys for joining us see you in the next one